Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Trogly's Guitar Show. Today, my friends, we are going to take a dive into the Jazz Box Arch Top Guitar World with a special guitar that needed my help to get to Germany within my forwarding service. So when it comes to big fancy jazz guitars, you might think of a Gibson, but you also have to remember the other big Mac daddy, D'Angelico. John D'Angelico is known as a master at creating these awesome arch tops, and his vintage examples go for some really crazy money. However, when he passes away in 1964, his apprentice of 12 years, Jimmy DeQuisto, ends up taking what he learned from D'Angelico and carried on the tradition with a new name brand. In John's later years, Jimmy was the one doing all the hard work, whereas John was doing some of the more finicky final last touches that makes his instruments that. You know, both of these guys, they got the D and the apostrophe in their name. Of course, they just go together. But it wasn't smooth sailing for Jimmy at first. He still had to win over the people with his own designs. And thankfully, within his first batch of 10, it all worked out in his favor. And just like some of the old DeQuistos, his own brand can sell for some pretty crazy money when you're getting the originals. Nowadays, I believe Fender owns DeQuisto as a name brand, so they're not quite as expensive when you get into the more modern ones. So what do we have here? Is it a vintage example that's $50,000 or a modern one that's $2,000? Either way, it's going to be awesome. Let's open it up and find out. Inside here, we have a modern era. Well, modern era. It was birthed in the 2000s at some point in time. We'll have to learn together to see if we can date it any further. But this is known as the Centura model. The vintage examples, yeah, they, they can go for quite crazy money, but this is a, an example of how he kind of evolved the brand. He kind of changed up the Fs, made them pretty interesting. Let's go ahead and get this thing out to take a look at it further. All right, so we don't do too many jazzy archbox guitars on this show, so I don't have a lot of frame of reference to really compare this to, but first glance holding this... It actually feels pretty nice. It's kind of like an L5 in a way. It's a very faded cherry sunburst. Definitely not clowny, and it's got that kind of like an orange hue to it, so it's just not quite over the top. We've got these giant cat eye sound holes, which, I mean, it definitely transforms the look of this. I remember Gibson made one that kind of looks similar to this in this Jazz Archbox episode. So that's why when I was asked to forward this, it's like, yeah, we gotta get a quick little video on this thing because, I mean, it's pretty cool. It's a very nice glossy finish, but besides our spruce top here, I mean, it's extra special back here even. We've got all the flame figuring of the maple, you've got it on the sides, it even looks like we have flame maple binding on this thing, as well as like a black violin-like stripe going down here. I mean, that is quite a fantastic looking piece. I didn't know exactly what to expect. Looks like our fretboard binding is also flame maple, so hey, that's pretty cool. Then check out our headstock here. We've got a darker wood up here with the emblem. And then if we flip it over to the back, we even have a fancy stinger. <laughs> so this is just kind of a, a cool fancy guitar. The neck doesn't have much in the figuring game, which is kind of strange as compared to like the back here, which just has so much going on. Check out the movement on that thing. But to learn more about this DeQuesto, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench to take an individual look at its parts and specs before we get to a short little playing sample. I mean, I'm not a jazz boxy guy. I'm not going to be the best player for this. But hey, that doesn't mean we can't still have fun. Inside the Centura model, or Centura, I'm not really sure how you pronounce it. Let's go ahead and take a look at all these unique, interesting parts. We don't have any electronics to talk about on this one. It's a complete acoustic model, but you've got other models that do have electronics if that's more your style, or you could just add a floating pickup to this. But the pickguard actually mounts to the side of the instrument right here using two screws. It's kind of a cool system that they've got going on here. It's a rather small pickguard, but enough to do its job, but it's all wooden. This appears to be an ebony wood that they make it out of. And there's like a thin finish over top of it, nothing extra glossy or anything. But then they would glue another little piece of ebony right here. That way you don't actually see any screws on the top drilling into the front of the instrument. I'm sure somebody would make the argument if you drill it into the top you're going to hurt the acoustic tonalities of it so I guess that's probably why they throw it in the side of the neck there. But the guard also has a little bit of a beveled edge right here that's kind of interesting. And then instead of an end bracket you've just got a little plastic spacer right there. But the true genius here is the plastic spacer doesn't actually touch the body unless you're putting weight on the pick guard itself so that prevents it from reacting to the finish too much. But now let's talk about this bridge. I've taped it down in place so it doesn't move because it's not pinned or anything as far as I'm aware. You can move it to wherever the intonation needs to be. But these are known as the Accutone Bridge. It's actually a little bit of a wedge system. 
So you have a normal bridge piece that looks like this, and then you have a little wedge over here that goes from really thin all the way to ultra thick. That's how you adjust your bridge up and down instead of using like thumb wheels. So this slides in like this for the highest action, then you slide in your other piece, and then there you go. So if you want to lower the action, it looks like you actually want to push this all the way over here. Now it's not lowering it a ton, but it is enough to change your action. I think when it came to me, it was set up about right here. So this has lots of downward adjustment if needed. It's an interesting little system that I guess a lot of other manufacturers have copied since. I suppose the thinking is less screws and thumb wheels and things you need, more wood, the better. But now let's talk the tailpiece. So it secures down here using three screws. That middle one's the strap button, and it kind of also keeps it secure, but you definitely need the other screws to help you there. But just like the rest of the instrument, this is also made out of an ebony wood, but it's like a real tailpiece where they just kind of sculpt out a little area right here, and then you just put your strings through it, and then the ball ends of them secure it into the tailpiece. So that makes it really easy to restring these. No trying to hit the prongs on the bottom side like sometimes you have to do for some Gibson tailpieces. So that was cool. But then on the side, they actually mount it to the guitar using a little metal bracket down here. They put a metal pin through there that looks like you can maybe adjust right there. And then they wrap this bracket around there in order to make this all one piece. So lots of puzzle playing with this guitar. So as far as the top, it is a two-piece spruce top. The center seam hides pretty good right here, but when you get right over top of it, you can definitely see the line. Now there's no separation or anything, but it is there. And you can see the really tight spruce wood grain. A lot of arch tops use spruce. And here you can see the perfluorine around the edges. And the flame maple binding and sides, all that that we were talking about earlier. But let's take a quick look inside the guitar. Kind of cool to see the flame figuring dancing on the other side. But you can see the kerfing along the edges. You'll see the exact same thing on the top. And here you can see the maple sides. But we'll also break out the endoscope to see the bracing on top. So here you can see where the bracing is glued to the top right there and they did all their chiseling. It looks like some sort of an X brace to me. And up there you can see the top row of the kerfing along the edges and the extra block of wood that they glue in there for the screws to go through for the tailpiece. Looks like they got a little bit sloppy over here with their glue, but okay. And there appears to be another little wooden brace right here. That's right where the tailpiece sits on top of. And this is our neck join area. You've got a couple of different blocks of wood. So this one right there, that's for your strap button at the top. And then this is the neck joining to the body of the guitar. And now we're in the cutaway area. Interestingly enough, they didn't have to use an additional block of wood there or anything. So a cool sight you don't always see every day. I think that sums up the body for the most part. I like how clearly you can actually see the kerfing along the edges though, even just, you know, regularly. So it makes sense that they took time to make these areas look really good. But really take a look at this neck. I love this feature. You see this line right here? They put another block of wood right here. That way you don't have your fretboard just hanging off the edge. There's a lot of Gibson models that just have this big empty space like an ES-295 and I've always hated that. So it's kind of cool to see another manufacturer's take on, you know, just beefing that area up. But again, we've got the flame maple binding right here. You've got your side marker inlays and this is a maple neck. And it's a 22 fretted instrument. Well, I mean, the last two are kind of cut short. You can get 22 on the high E string at least, only 20 on the low, but you don't have any fret markers on this. It's just a straight up ebony fretboard and the frets run over the side of the neck. But I told you it's a flame maple binding, right? They actually leave the top exposed so it's a white color. So it looks more like traditional binding, but again, that's actually a wooden binding. It just makes things look fancier. Scale lengthwise is 25 and a half inches with a 12 inch fretboard radius. And I measure a 1.7 inch nut width. I buy the 12th increases to 2.1. Has a first fret neck depth of 0.85. Then we'll take it at the 10th for 0.94. So it's not a huge neck by any means. It definitely has a rounded C-shaped neck profile. Here's what that neck profile looks like at the first and the 10th fret. You can see it definitely flattens out a little bit, but still definitely within the C-shape territory. Now it looks like they construct their necks very similar to how Gibson does. The truss rod channel gets capped off with a maple block and the truss rod style is fairly similar. And then if I had to guess, this is probably a Zircote headstock veneer, but I guess it also could be rosewood. But this is what our headstock looks like, and you kind of got that interesting swoop going on up here. And check this out, ebony tips to your tuners. That's real wood, and that's a real mother of pearl logo. The truss rod cover is very similar to the rest of the rosewood parts on this one. Kind of an interesting vase shape, I guess you could say. And the back looks like this. And to me, that looks like a bone nut, but I could be wrong. 
Moving on to the backside now. We already saw this earlier, but yeah, this is a nice flamed back. This is going to come to life so much in those outside B-roll shots. I mean, just take a look at it. Not too shabby under regular lighting conditions either, but not much to talk about here. You don't have any back access, control plates, or anything crazy like that. It is a two-piece maple center seam right here. The sides are also flame, and the back has the same flame maple binding all around it. But they did do a very nice burst job. I like the edges on this one. It's showing up a little bit darker in the camera than it actually is in person. It's more of a faded orange, like what you're seeing right here. It's captured it on the back but I really like the natural areas too. And you can find these in other colors if orange burst isn't your favorite. However, there doesn't ever appear to be too many of these on the market at any particular time. But check this out, a flame maple heel cap. I haven't seen that before, pretty cool. And I'm surprised an instrument this old doesn't have any seam lines showing. It must be a poly finish. I'm not 100% sure on that, but just a beautiful plain maple neck back here straight wood grain so it's likely a very stable neck and once again another rosewood slash zircote looking stinger on the back just to give it a little bit of an extra flair and the tuners are made in japan the side profile view is kind of cool because you've got both of the layers on the top and the back so you just get the maple exposed but if you look right here, it actually looks like there might be a different piece of wood kind of surrounding this. It looks a little bit more reddish. All said and done, it weighs six pounds, one and a half ounces. So just around six. Let's go ahead, sit down with it and give it a strum. What are my final thoughts on this DeQuisto? Hey, it's actually a pretty cool guitar. I'm not gonna say it's my favorite aesthetically looking from the front, but let me tell you, the entire time I played this guitar, it was never about what the top looked like because they just look like regular F-holes when you're playing. They don't look like these weird, ah, faces. I was just really appreciating that slick fretboard and the flame maple binding along the neck. So if you ever see one of these, or just any archtop guitar in general, go ahead and pick it up. I'm really intimidated by these things too because I'm not much of a jazz guitar player. I'd love to know some of their stuff, but I need to practice up a little bit more on that. But you can use these just like acoustic guitars as well. They've got some pretty good projection to them. Here it is with more of a roomy sound to it.
So thank you Troglodytes for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I gotta get this thing packed up and shipped off to Germany. All right, take care.